Hi everyone, my name is Paul Thompson, and I'm going to tell you a little bit today about artificial intelligence approaches for discovery in Alzheimer's disease biobanks. And this is joint work with members of the AI for AD consortium, which is a national initiative to apply artificial intelligence methods to questions related to Alzheimer's disease. A couple of disclosures. Uh, we re received funding from Biogen and also Kairos Venture Capital uh, for work unrelated to this presentation, and also from the NIA and the Alzheimer's Association uh, for, for work related to uh, what I'll talk about. So there's a number of ways that artificial intelligence approaches can enhance AD research. Uh, the first of them is the analysis of disease processes in the brain, and for instance, dementia subtyping. So we can use biobanks of imaging and clinical data worldwide and see if AI and machine learning methods can help us to classify dementia, to identify subtypes, the component processes that are going on, and in particular, the ATNV classification system that's trying to understand the role of amyloid tau, neurodegeneration, vascular disease, and dementia. We can try and disentangle some of these processes going on. And this should refine the genetic analysis of the component processes that tend to occur in uh, AD and other dementias. The other way is to understand how Alzheimer's disease risk genes exert their effects in the brain and how we can counteract this. So if we could discover when and where in the brain the genetic risk loci exert their effects, we'd also be able to understand whether uh, existing and novel drugs that modulate these pathways uh, are having an inhibitory uh, or beneficial effect on the degeneration. So AI is often used in precision medicine, in fact, increasingly so, um, to make sense of large volumes of patient data. Uh, biomarker data now from hundreds of thousands of data, patients have been collected, their whole genome sequences, their plasma and blood analytes, uh, imaging from PET to MRI, and even uh, mobile sensor data from actigraphy to give a real-time estimate of what's going on for patients. And we'd like to use these data to help make uh, diagnostic predictions, prognostic predictions, and identify patients who might respond best to certain types of, of treatments. Now, one of the AI approaches that's becoming increasingly popular is deep learning. And so one example is convolutional neural networks. Um, also other types of uh, deep learning method, generative adversarial networks are used with uh, images and recurrent neural networks are used with uh, genome sequences. But in this example, uh, a neural network, as you can see on the left, uh, top left there, has been developed to identify a person, a person called Sarah, based on distilling certain uh, features from the images um, and deciding whether or not this is an image of her based on lots of different examples and dis distilling increasingly abstract features. When we apply this to neuroimaging, we use the same uh, principle uh, in three dimensions to try and extract successively more refined features from the data to make predictions of their diagnosis. Um, in a simple example, it might be predicting their age just to check if the method works. And then in a more complex example, we might be subtyping pathology. We might want to know if the person has certain subtypes uh, of dementia. Now, a huge success in this field uh, is work by Chao Gan Yan and colleagues in Beijing, where they developed um, essentially a deep learning method of CNN that um, classified Alzheimer's disease with over 90% accuracy, just reading in the MRI image. So no, no PET images, no other data. And this was based on learning features that were diagnostic in um, a little over 80,000 scans from 50,000 people. The way they did this is they pre-trained the neural network on a simpler task, uh, deciding if the person was male or female, and then they refined the neural network uh, to, to identify Alzheimer's disease. So this is really um, a landmark uh, achievement. Duygu Tosun and her group at UCSF um, has also been using uh, neuropathology data in conjunction with uh, in vivo neuroimaging to identify features that we can identify in living patients um, that will tell us whether they have certain pathologies that are normally only identified at autopsy. So TDP43, which is an important protein in, in, in dementia, Lewy bodies or angiopathy. These were things that uh, she trained uh, a neural network classifier to identify with 86 to 89 percent accuracy. And you can imagine that knowing these disease subtypes may help you to identify uh, treatment response or, or subgroups of patients that might uh, do better with certain types of treatments. Now, one of the accusations about deep learning is that it's a bit of a black box. So there's been a lot of attention on interpretable deep learning methods. Um, this uh, CNN uh, has an attention module that tells you which parts of the image, which features were useful in telling whether or not someone had Alzheimer's disease or, or, or other tasks. 
And this can also be applied to other types of data. So Andy Sakin and Taiho Zhou at Indiana University have been reading in um, tau sensitive pet data, positron emission tomography, and feeding into a neural network uh, images from people with and without AD to identify the features or clusters of features that are most informative. And then they can go on and use this uh, in, in new patients to identify uh, whether or not uh, they, they have AD. Now, one of the complexities in classifying Alzheimer's disease and dementias is all of these processes are progressive. They're going on at the same time and they, they also progress. So a really landmark study by Jacob Vogel and colleagues just out in Nature Medicine identified four different subtypes in the way that tau pathology, one of the major component uh, pathologies in Alzheimer's disease, in the way that that progresses and the systems affected and the sequence was identified to be different using a method called SUSTAIN. This is an algorithm for subtyping and staging. Uh, it will output scores for a given patient that will tell you what stage and subtype uh, they're in. And there may even be a, com this is a continuum, of course, there may be a combination of processes uh, that are going on. Similar work's also being done with FDG PET uh, to look at metabolism where the trajectories and subtypes can be defined, not just by data-driven clustering, but also by cognitive subtypes. So Colin Groot and others, uh, and, and, and Rick Gossen Coppel and Oscar Hansen have talked about uh, relating these trajectories to different clinical subtypes uh, as well. Also on the genetic side, um, using imaging can help us to identify distinct genetic drivers of these processes in the brain. So this is work by uh, the CHARGE Consortium and the Enigma Consortium, um, led by Nicola Armstrong, where she found that the um, distribution of white matter hyperintensities in the brain, which is a sign of vascular disease, um, was different in different patients. And the genetic markers associated with these different uh, changes was also partially different. So again, you can see how subtyping based on imaging is a valuable approach to understand the genetic drivers of the different processes. In Enigma, uh, which is an international consortium, we've also been doing very large scale global genetic studies of brain measures. There's now uh, over 2,000 people collecting over 10,000 uh, neuroimaging data sets uh, where questions can be asked about the genetic drivers of different processes in the brain. Direct genome-wide association studies of measures derived from brain images have yielded over 500 locations in the genome where common genetic variation is associated with these important biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. And so as you travel around the cerebral cortex, the brain's gray matter, you can see that there are certain markers that influence um, the volume or the rate of change uh, of measures in these different areas. And they partially overlap for different parts of the brain and for different features. And also on the right there, you see a landmark study by uh, Charge and Enigma, which identified now uh, uh, around 50 loci that affect the volumes of important subcortical structures uh, that are affected in, in dementia. Now, some of the take home messages are, we do begin to understand what the most dangerous risk genes for Alzheimer's disease are doing in the brain. So APOE4, many of you are familiar with, um, each allele of that genotype uh, triples your risk approximately for uh, developing Alzheimer's disease. And we found looking at brain images that as you get older, on average, the hippocampal volume, the size of the brain's major memory system, is progressively reduced in people that carry this risk genotype versus people who don't. And this was a genome-wide association study of hippocampal volume measured on MRI in over 60 worldwide cohorts, where by the time you're age 70 or so, the carriers of this uh, risk genotype have two standard deviations reduction in their hippocampal volume uh, relative to, to non-carriers. We also can now explain a little over 4% of the variation in hippocampal volume just from common variants that we can identify in a standard uh, saliva-based genotyping test. So if you look at these results here from Adrian Campos and colleagues in Brisbane, they pulled data from Enigma, from CHARGE and the UK Biobank, and they discovered over 500 loci in the genome that affect subcortical volumes, over 50 markers that uh, influence the volume of the hippocampus, this key area uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And what they were also able to do is um, make apologenic prediction. In other words, they could measure for each individual a linear combination of the genetic markers that accounted for a little over 4% of the variation in these structures. And of course, the hippocampal volume is very important indeed uh, for understanding genetic risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease. 
Rachel Brower and the Enigma Plasticity Consortium also discovered 14 loci in the genome beyond APOE locus that affect the speed of brain aging. So they collected uh, data from people who had been scanned twice with MRI, where they could measure a rate of volume loss for each of the key structures in the brain. And they identified genetic variants, very important genetic variants, uh, where carriers of these uh, have a higher rate uh, of brain degeneration. Uh, very, very interesting study uh, there. So one of the um, ways that we can bring this information together is using machine learning and deep learning to aggregate combinations of signals in the genome to understand what they do to uh, combinations of systems and markers in the brain. So in early work using sparse CCA or sparse uh, PLS, Marco Lorenzi and colleagues identified sets of markers in the genome that were maximally correlated with changes that are going on in brain images. And you could imagine that you could subtype uh, the types of degeneration happening in the image and go and look in the genome for markers that might be influencing it. Another step in, in this uh, direction is by Gunga Chen and Li Shen, uh, who have a, a bioinformatics approach that favors the selection of, of druggable biomarkers. So it will go and look in the genome for markers that we have uh, current drugs uh, to influence and identify what their contribution is to the changes uh, that are going on. And the mathematics of these approaches is still developing. Younger Chun's uh, placebo system contains uh, published statistical information on links between genomic predictors, blood and brain biomarkers, and clinical outcomes, uh, including neuropath outcomes in very large numbers of patients' co cohorts with AD and related dementias. And this is a way of storing known information between drug effects uh, on um, important AD biomarkers and the process of discovery of how the pathways influenced by existing drugs relate to the degeneration that we see uh, playing out over time. And this is being used to help identify drug candidates for repurposing. Another line of work uh, also using deep learning is dividing the whole genome sequences from patients across the world into tiles or a dictionary of tractable units that can then be read in to predictive algorithms. So work by Sarah and Sasha Saranik, a Curie Corporation, uh, and Heng Huang, who's an expert on, on machine learning, is looking into essentially reading in segments of the genome and asking which combination of markers is most strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease or for that matter, uh, other types of dementia. And they have found not only known uh, genes, APOE of course is coming up, but also novel uh, loci in the genome where not just the marker, but also the pattern uh, and, and occurrence of these markers along with other motifs in the genome is important uh, for predicting uh, Alzheimer's disease. So just to summarize, some notable successes uh, are already occurring in applying artificial intelligence to the study of Alzheimer's disease. AI and other machine learning methods are now being used for diagnosis, for prognosis and subtyping, and also for staging of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias based on patterns we're learning from MRI, from PET, uh, and from even neuropath uh, databases. Uh, hot topics include the detection of pathology from in vivo imaging, uh, things that normally would only be identifiable post-mortem are now beginning to be discovered uh, in vivo. And one of the motivations for this type of subtyping is to customize treatment uh, and even drug trial design for patients where we know what combination of processes are going on uh, in their brain and blood. Some challenges and open questions are whether the AI and machine learning subtypes correspond to genetic subtypes. So we talked about uh, sparse CCA and its deep learning analog, deep sparse CCA, one of the methods that the AI for AD project is pursuing. It'd be very interesting if there was a genetic signature that was corresponding to some of these trajectories that we see, and then we can separate and identify patients that carry this and understand how to treat them. We also have discovered over 15 loci that affect the speed of brain aging in sequential neuroimaging data. And so there's a lot of interest in understanding how and where in the brain those loci act. Do they act early in life when we could potentially prevent their effects in principle, or do they occur later in life, uh, but only in a subset of patients who we could identify? There's also great interest in using bioinformatics data on druggable pathways existing in novel drugs uh, to help uh, repurpose drugs that affect the pathways that we identify. So we mentioned Yunka Chun's placebo system. There's also very important work by the AMPAD consortium uh, in aggregating known drug effects on all of the markers that we've talked about today. So thanks so much again for your attention. Um, it's a privilege to talk with you today and uh, any questions are very, very welcome. Thanks so much.